Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. It's the three o'clock block on a given Wednesday. And this is our show about uh, global connections right now. We talk about the U.S. exit from Afghanistan uh, with our regular host, contributor Carlos Suarez from the East West Center. Hi, Carlos. Aloha, Jay. Always a pleasure to reconnect. And obviously, you know, unfortunately, looking at a tough, tough dilemma that we're facing here in the days ahead, but we need to we need to talk about it. We need to understand it, even though we don't have all the well, the outcomes yet, but thank yeah. you. And yeah, let's put let's put all that aside for just a few minutes and yeah, talk to Shannon course. Tanganon. Shannon is a spokesman for Hawaiian Electric, and she's here to tell us about a very interesting and community oriented program that Hawaiian Electric is doing starting tomorrow. Am I right, Shannon? Tell us about the yeah. program. Yes, thanks, Jay, for having us. Um, tomorrow, we're going to be hosting um, some public vaccination clinics at our Kahe power plant and the, um, sorry, Campbell Industrial Park uh, generating station. So these are vaccination clinics that are open to the public for our employees as well. And it's done in conjunction with the Kapolei uh, Chamber of Commerce and local health providers. Okay, so tell me what, and here's the, the website. So I, I should be best advised to register for this and I register on your website. Uh, and then I go there pursuant to the instructions on the website. So what do I have to do? How do I register? Well, if you go to our website um, and that would redirect you to the Queen's Health Systems um, sign up procedure. Uh, so really we encourage the pre-registration, but if you do just walk in, they'll take you as well. There's no charge. There is also no need for uh, proof of you know, insurance. So we really just wanted to make it as easy as possible for those who, who really need it. Um, the West Oahu area um, is showing the one of the lower uh, vaccination rates in our in our uh, state. So we just wanted to make sure that we, you know, partnered with the Kapolei Chamber of Commerce, the health providers, and um, really the Kapolei. I think it's called the Local Emergency Action Network. Uh, it's called Clean. Um, that's a uh, Campbell Industrial Park um, area businesses that really pulled together and wanted to offer these um, public vaccination clinics for, um, you know, really residents of that area to try to make it convenient uh, for them to get vaccinated. We really want to just do our part to lower the infection rate since right now it's just really, um, you know, out of control. Uh, so we just wanted to do our part. Yeah, and pred predictions are dire as to how much worse it can get. So it's very important that everybody in Hawaii gets vaccinated, no exceptions, no ifs, ands, or buts. So this is very helpful for Hawaiian Electric and Queens to do this. So can you give us a handle on um, how to get there? If I'm coming from, I don't know, the freeway, for example, how do I get to Kahi? And how do I get to the, um, uh, what's the second location? Campbell, K K Camp Park. Campbell Park, yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, okay, <laughs> I'll try my best. But really, to get to Kahe um, Power Plant, really, you just follow H1 uh, West all the way um, to until it becomes Farrington Highway. And you really can't miss it. It's going to be on your right hand side. And if you're coming from um, the Waianae area, they'll know exactly you know where to go. It'll be on your left hand side, and it'll be in our parking lot and that address is i believe 91-196 um farrington highway uh i'm sorry i'm sorry the campbell industrial park is 91-196 manua street and then the kahe is 92-200 farrington highway so the campbell industrial park will be set up in the front lawn kahe in the parking lot um, Really, you won't be able to miss it. I believe there'll be tents. Um, so, okay. Well, we got to get everybody vaccinated. Uh, yeah, Carlos, do you have any questions or comments about this program? Well, I'm, I'm grateful to hear that because, of course, at the end of the day, we need to be able to reach you know the communities as directly. And as you noted, this is a part of the island and the state where we've had perhaps lower rates, and you know for different reasons. But certainly, accessibility or where to go is one of them and so this can help alleviate that so I'm, I'm very grateful to hear this news and thank you for sharing that Shannon. Thank you we're, we're happy to cooperate um, with the uh, and partner really with the Chamber of Commerce so we're hoping we get a good turnout um, 
and just thank you for allowing us to be on today and share the information. All right, so this is tomorrow, and is it one day or two days? Actually, there's um, August 31st is another day as well. And then you can also come back um, in September. There's a date in September uh, for, you know, for you to get your second shot. You know, Fabulous. we're trying to make it as accessible yeah. as possible. So th this, is a, uh, this is so you can get both shots through this program. That's great. Definitely. Well, good for you, Shannon. Good for Hawaiian Electric. This is a real community service, and we all appreciate it. Uh, Thank I you. hope I hope they come from far and wide uh, tomorrow to get their shots. I hope so too. I'm hope I'm hoping there will be line people <laughs> get vaccinated. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you, Shannon. Shannon Tanganon, a Hawaiian Electric Company. Thank you. Great. Okay, we're going to go to you, Carlos, now, and uh, we're going to we're going to talk about uh, exiting from Afghanistan. This is a very difficult kind of problem. Yes. Uh, and uh, let, uh, okay, we're going to say we're going to say farewell to Shannon. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, I was thinking about this, and I came up with a few words, and I would like to uh, offer you my words uh, in the hopes that that helps our conversation. Number sure. one, number one is with regard to Afghanistan baked in, meaning that the problems in Afghanistan are baked in for a long time. Um, and um, the uh, the government hasn't been functional ever, uh, and it's a kleptocracy. Some people say all it involves is stealing American money and putting it in the pockets of those who are in office. Um, this is a big problem. And, uh, and then, of course, you know you have a failure to govern, a failure to make a social compact with the people. So that's that's one thing. Uh, the second is um, is um, uh, booby trap. Uh, the term booby trap uh, refers to the fact that uh, Trump uh, broke, intentionally broke the immigration system as would allow uh, Afghans to uh, come to the United States under the special, uh, special visa program uh, back, uh, back during his uh, administration. Stephen Miller did that. It was reported on uh, Rachel Maddow a couple of days ago. And uh, this this uh, this is a burden that, that Biden has to carry because mm -hmm. um, you know he's he's dealing with a system that was intentionally sabotaged back a few months ago and and then of course you remember that um, in the transition uh, Trump undermined the transition so so Biden lost uh, two three months of an ability to transition properly between election day and inauguration day and he was behind the eight ball in terms of dealing with this and other problems. The third term, we can go through this later, is the uh, train wreck. And that refers to what is going to happen in the next few days. Uh, and the fourth term is um, you know, a, a, a political meltdown um, because of you know, the notoriety, the criticism he's had on this, uh, the failure uh, uh, for him to get his um, initiatives through Congress because it's so dysfunctional. Uh, and ultimately voter suppression, which is going to affect the election in 2022. So we are really in a crisis mode now about all of that. I know you're mm -hmm. not necessarily as pessimistic as I am, but let me address one of those mm -hmm. at a time. Yeah. So the sure. first one, the first one uh, would be uh, baked in. I mean, mm -hmm. what is the condition of the Afghan government, country, social compact now? Yeah, well, again, in, in a lot of this, we're just seeing unravel you know, before our eyes very quickly, uh, but the bottom line is at the end of the day, uh, what was the government in Afghanistan has collapsed, it has fallen, and, and it was always very tenuous, and we know for years and years that it was only able to hold uh, the area of Kabul and, and many other parts of the country were effectively out of their control. Uh, but in these last months, as we saw it uh, coming, uh, effectively by the time uh, it was clear and, and once the U.S. made its, uh, you know, its own announcement of, of, of withdrawal, uh, Things move rather quickly. And, and, and let me say real quick, I want to step back and say, on one hand, the withdrawal itself was never, well, no, let me rephrase that. Um, the question of the withdrawal, it maybe is not as much the debate. Uh, it's more, and we can see a lot of either mistakes or missteps that have been made and a fair amount of criticism that is being made about that. Because on one hand, it seems to be a failure of intelligence. How would we not know that this, you know, the capacity to you know collapse of that government was not going to happen. I mean, uh, our, our intelligence community does planning to look at all the scenarios, and so they should have been able to uh, more effectively uh, make clear that this could happen. Um, on the other hand, I mean, I guess you, you say this baked in, and, and, and here 
uh, one of the biggest mistakes I think is that you know we look back 20 years ago. What was the rationale for going into Afghanistan? It was the response to 9/11. It was the safe haven that government of ta the Taliban regime at the time was providing to Osama bin Laden. Well, within a short time, that mission would be morphed into nation building uh, and uh, human rights. You know, trying to essentially bring you know a, a, a change to this country. We look back now and look, uh, we've had 30 years of two major powers, the Soviet Union before us, 20 years of the U.S., effectively trying to nation build or trying to create some kind of a client state. This has been an abysmal failure. Uh, and uh, so that, that much is clear. Uh, but, you know, beyond that, I think we also have to look at this is a situation very complicated because it's not just the U.S., uh, and, and yet we are calling the shots. We have the U.S. allies, primarily the NATO and you know, other you know, European allies in particular, but you've got the dynamics of China kind of and their interest, because curiously, we don't realize this, but the Chinese probably would prefer that we not move out so hastily because it's going to create a vacuum for them. And these Taliban forces are likely to meddle a little bit more or maybe be more critical of China's support or not support. It's, you know, uh, uh, China's uh, attack on the, the Uyghur minorities in Western China. And so there's a different dynamic going on there. But I'm more interested in that, and I want to talk a little bit more about the international angle, particularly how, touching on your second point, uh, the booby trap. You mentioned Trump setting up, uh, or maybe you know, effectively changing immigration policies that have complicated, uh, you know, the ability to bring more refugees, and that's certainly very true. That that's a challenge because you can't change immigration policy without laws uh, through the Congress. You can only do so much. Um, but it, there's even more than that. I think one thing that Trump did that also has cost us. He effectively negotiated directly with the Taliban, you may recall, and did not include the government of Afghanistan uh, and did not include the European and, you know, other, let's say the NATO allies. And even today, as we're looking at Biden's response, effectively, he has been taking a rather unilateral approach, somewhat uh, curious, because he is, after all, a you know, multilateralist, at least they came to office with that. And his team, a foreign policy team, very much, you know, experienced, competent, although obviously making some mistakes here. Uh, but they are, the paradox is they are very much the multilateral Atlanticists. You know, many of the team have a lot of experience dealing with our allies. But essentially, Biden is somewhat going it alone. And this is where there's some concern and a lot of criticism coming from, from many of the allies about rather, you know, hastily the, the way in which the withdrawal has, has been going. And the, the fact that he has dug his heels, Biden, that we're leaving 31 August no matter what. And you had an emergency meeting uh, just yesterday of the G7, uh, and you know the, the criticism from the UK, uh, concerns from uh, Macron and others about how it's going. So it's a very messy, complicated situation. And then, of course, on the ground, we have just dynamics changing, at, you know, as we speak. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, we've also got some dramatic numbers. I mean, just in the last what nine days, we're seeing figures that over eighty-two thousand people have been evacuated. Uh, I think about 4,500 of them are Americans. Uh, they're expecting another 500. But uh, today, the New York Times is reporting there's about 1,500 Americans in Afghanistan who are not, you know, either not been found or are not likely to leave because it gets complicated. Many of them have families themselves that are Afghan and, and sort of mixed. And, you know, getting them out is, again, it's a challenge of the immigration policy that may not be set up to do it. So it's a, it's a tough, complicated mess. And it's, uh, you know, again, I mentioned this irony that you have Biden rather going it alone somewhat in, in a unilateral way. Um, and yet, you know, this is where we're seeing a lot of criticism from, from you know, many of our allies. Uh, that, yeah. yeah, well, going, going it alone means you don't have anybody with you when you want to um, negotiate. Because, um, you know, there, there's the implicit threat of, of having several nations deal with you, deal with the Taliban. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. really have that. There's, there's nobody but, but us, nobody but him. And so he loses, um, you know, the, the possibility of sanctions by several. Now he can only mm -hmm. do one, probably. Yeah. Uh, but the, the next term is a train wreck. And you mentioned just as we started the show yeah. um, that there's a train wreck starting already today because the Taliban uh, are, have now, or the State Department has said, the airport is no longer secure so that Americans cannot come. What, what happened? That is really awful. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, I'm, uh, just in the last hour, I've read a report that's come out uh, from the New York Times, um, and it is saying that the State Department has issued an advisory to those in Afghanistan to stay away from the airport, to not come. Uh, again, a very mixed signal, because that's obviously the only place right now where we're having any evacuations. 
Uh, but that suggests that there's possibly an imminent threat of a potential you know, a violence, maybe a terrorist attack, or who knows. Uh, also, the Australian government has issued a warning to its citizens there to stay away from the airport. Again, this is just an example of the dramatic uh, you know, things unfolding. Uh, we just don't know, and, and it's hard to get accurate information. At the end of the day, you know, journalists are one of the most at risk, and, and they have a limited capacity right now to get us the best information. So we're, you know, we're, we're relying on little pieces of information here and there. Uh, but uh, these most recent warnings uh, suggest that it's a very fluid, dynamic situation that might get uglier before it gets better. We just don't know. Yeah, what, what's interesting is that Biden was the guy who set up the uh, August 31 date, didn't he? Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> well, it, it was and then they're taking advantage of that date. Yeah, you know, uh, I was just going to say, initially, Trump had, had proposed the deadline to exit by September 1st, uh, essentially, you know, the, the, the anniversary, or well, the 9-11, the I'm sorry, 9-11. Uh, but of course, once Biden is in power, and then over these last couple of months, effectively, that announcement was, was made. Uh, and here again, I mean, plenty of criticism of, of mistakes and, 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 you know, missteps. How can the State Department, for example, not be ready to close down an embassy? I mean, we, we had to do, actually, 20 years ago, no, no, let me step back uh, Previously, when the Soviet Union had invaded and, and basically eventually when the Taliban did come to power in 94, they effectively took over the U.S. embassy. It was quite a drama and it remained closed for years. Uh, I can remember in the early 2000s, we actually at, at Hawaii Pacific University, I was, we hosted a visitting uh, State Department uh, official who, uh, Anne Wright, uh, who would become a peace activist uh, after her, her resignation. But she was the person sent to reopen that embassy back uh, after we finally, you know, came and overthrew the Taliban. Well, again, back to this question, you know, we see this hasty, you know, burning of papers and getting out of the embassy and, you know, recreating the sagas that we saw in, you know, in past uh, situations. Wouldn't they have been better prepared or, or begun, you know, the process earlier? And so there's some real concerns about that. Uh, mm -hmm. other, yeah, other than that, I mean, you, you spoke about sort of the, the train wreck itself and, and, and here, uh, Again, this just there's a really it's a moving situation that we don't fully know. Well, it sounds like the train wreck has already started. The wreck is we were already off the rails here. We don't know whether to go to the airport. If we don't go to the airport, where do we go? How do we get out of the country? Does that mean we have to stay around even if we don't want to? Um, and then, of course, there's all these um, uh, Afghans who are, are still in the country, and we really haven't offered them a way out. We're not we haven't finished the job of removing Afghans who worked with the United States. To whom we owe a debt, um, they're still stuck. So yeah, the Americans yeah. are stuck, the Afghans are stuck, and I'm not sure, you know, maybe even the American troops, remember we brought in 6,000 troops, uh, they got to get out too. And, mm -hmm. and it's a, a sequence problem. When do you take them out? Presumably they're going to protect the others. It's yeah. like, you know, the, the warning in the airplane where it says, you know, take your mask first so you can help your child, right? The yeah. oxygen, okay. Same thing here. When do the troops leave? We need them. This is going to have some real drama at the very end. Um, you know, what is uh, um, August 30, August 31st is Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, we're, we're talking about literally the, within a week. Uh, so things are going to move rather quickly. And again, you know, we can expect that it might go very badly. I, and again, this recent imminent threat is, is an example. And yet it may not. It may play out in a way. And, and, and let's be clear, most of the American citizens have been evacuated by now in the last 10 days. Uh, we're told about 4,500 and another 500 here in the next day or two. Uh, but there are a number who have remained and some of them out of their own choice, some of them out of the complications that they have not been able to get you know, adequate papers for their maybe Afghan family members, because there are a number of American citizens who, who are, you know, uh, let's say, have mixed families. Uh, so it is complicated. Uh, and the end of the day, right now, today, it is the Kabul airport. That's the only exit point. Now, once that airport does close, and it will sometime very soon, um, it, it, it's going to be interesting to see the dynamic shifting to the, a, a land-based uh, evacuation in, in, the, in the medium term. And, and oh, not evacuation, let me say more uh, opportunities for, um, I, I, I guess, uh, the borders to be, you know, allowing them to go out, because that's the only other way if you can't get out to the airport. Now, we know today the Taliban effectively controls the country and all of its exit points. Well, not only that, but Kab Kabul is is, <clears throat> is in the center of the country. So if you wanted to get to a border east, west, north, south, yeah. you have to travel hundreds of, of kilometers at least. Absolutely. Yeah, no, no, this is a, a grueling task and it won't be easy for most. And those who are trying to get out are the vulnerable ones who are obviously going to be the potential targets for 
you know, uh, harm and violence and and and, and right. And, and we know that the the Taliban are not particularly well organized, so that even if the uh, leadership, uh, what's yeah. his name, uh, uh, Barasada, the the mm -hmm. de facto leader of the Taliban yeah. right now, even if uh, Barasada says in one says one thing in Kabul, um, sure. some fellow, uh, uh, you know, two hundred yeah. kilometers away, is of may course. not agree, and he may attack. Uh, a convoy trying to get out of the country, yeah. whether or not he he has been given authority to do that. Absolutely, and and you know I was reading some some reports. Uh, I guess this this leader you've mentioned has given an interview and talk, and he is sort of signaling to the women, of course, who are you know, at tremendous risk because now you know, in this past twenty years since it's in more a more open society, women have been more free to go out in the street without you know covering and then to be uh, essentially you know uh, more open. Well, uh, he specifically announced that women need to stay home until we can train, you know, the forces, you know, a little better how to treat women. It's like, well, good luck. That's not going to be uh, happening overnight. And, and you know, so, you so trust them. I mean, a rest Barisada made statements uh, in, a, in an interview uh, in Emirates, I think it was uh, a few days ago, where he was very conciliatory about women and, um, you know, uh, organizing a, a civilized government. And no sooner did he say those things. Uh, that then they unraveled all around uh, Afghanistan. So uh, I mean, I think I think we really have to take it with a grain of salt. Whatever they say right now, they have no credibility because of events over the past few days. No, no, absolutely no. And 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 there's no reason to believe that they're going to become you know milk toast you know uh, you know democracy oriented. No, uh, it's going to be probably once they effectively seal off and, and this evacuation process ends from the airport and they have control of it. Uh, it, it's likely to be a pretty grim uh, outcome for, for those who got stuck behind and couldn't get out. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of concern because, uh, you know, women, journalists, you know, anybody working on human rights, uh, you know, these are people that are going to be at very high risk uh, of, of retaliation, of, 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 you know, of basically death. Uh, and let's remember, I mean, the, the, uh, when they did rule, they did, the Taliban came to power in 1994, and this was about five years after the, the withdrawal of the Soviet Union and it, its forces. Uh, and they had a very brutal, uh, you know, regime. Uh, they had public uh, uh, punishments, including floggings and uh, amputations and mass executions. Uh, they, you know, these are not, uh, you know, uh, well. Uh, and and while that was a long time ago, again, that 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 those, you know, that is what we have to look forward to. And 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 yet things are also not the same. On another level, there's differences both in the region and even in the U.S. I would say, in in an interesting way, where. Domestic politics in the U.S. is not what it was 20 years ago. Uh, on one hand, we know it's more polarized, divided, but also, you know, difficult to, to sell the idea of, of, you know, what what we're doing there. So, having said that, I think there's not a lot of support for the U.S. to stay in Afghanistan. No, there's no big, you know, rallying. You know, let's, you know, another year, another five years. Of course not. So again, I go back to this: the withdrawal and, and exit of the U.S. is the correct policy. You know, the question is, how do you do it? How do you do it in a way? And I think there's a lot of criticism that the U.S. did not effectively bring in and buy in our most important NATO allies because they were there throughout the whole time, and and that's why right now, rightfully, many of them are very critical you know, towards Biden, and 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 effectively we've got a we've got to handle not just the crisis there, but a lot of uh, damage control you know, with with the uh, with the allies. It strikes me strange as the as that Biden sent to the CIA director Burns over there to talk to the Taliban. Uh, a CIA director doesn't usually get involved in diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, he could he could have brought uh, um, Kamala Harris, who is yeah, al already yeah. in Asia. That's she right. Flown, flown is so simple, but I guess mm -hmm. he didn't he didn't want to put her in the um, you know in in the in the dip diplomatic engagement uh, arena. Um, but query what 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 effect did that have? Was that useful? Mm -hmm. Was it was it misdirected or useful? Um, and what, whatever came out because it was. You know, because Burns and neither Burns nor anybody else said what happened. Did they yeah, achieve anything yeah. there? Well, again, we don't we don't have any concrete uh, you know results to speak to. I mean, it, it was quite a dramatic uh, announcement because, again, as you said, uh, it's not typical that the CIA director flies, especially to a you know a hot spot and in a crisis you know situation as we have there. Uh, I have not seen again any of the outcome. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, it, it does signal that, you know, by sending a pretty, you know, prominent high uh, official like that, I mean, it, it's a way of trying to deal directly with him. But at, for what? What are they gaining from it? That's yeah. not clear. So I don't I think we Burns, really know. I'd be, if I were Burns, I'd be happy I hadn't been kidnapped. Yeah. That, that did present itself as a possibility. Okay, but let's yeah. let's go to the next thing is worldview. 
I, I know uh, you know you wanted to talk about the the world um, the world's view of this, uh, not only Europe but everybody because it's on the front page everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this affect our image uh, franchise? Yeah, and again, it's in mixed ways. I, I said earlier how um, obviously this has been a, also a crisis with our allies in the sense that you know we've rather been seen as somewhat going alone or, or maybe not being as flexible as some of them would have liked. I think at the end of the day, we needed to have brought them in more carefully to, to you know, understand the, the situation and, and get, let's say, everybody on the same plate. Uh, and that has not happened. And you have a different situation in, in, in among the different allies. Uh, uh, for example, uh, again, this meeting that was just brought together. Uh, let me see, I had a point here I was going to look at. Oh, well, no, uh, one, one thought was that you had, for example, the uh, the British Parliament has had a lot of, uh, you know, acrimony and and and, and criticism of this. Uh, you've also had uh, the case where um, uh, in France, uh, the President Macron there, he has of course got his eye for a re-election next year, so he's trying to be careful not to, and stressing that the EU cannot, uh, you know, be expected to to, to house or, or no to receive, you know, an exaggerated amount of, of migrants. I mean, there is a desire to address the refugees and and, and those who, no, no, let me be clear. Those who specifically worked and collaborated with the NATO, you know, forces—that is, uh, you know, the, the translators and, and and those who were, let's say, directly, uh, because there's a responsibility of this. They were, they were basically uh, hired and, and brought on. Uh, but it's a sensitive issue again throughout Europe. Uh, uh, about uh, you recall six years ago now, and, and we, you know, had a lot of discussions at the time. The major migration crisis in Europe it had a dramatic effect on domestic politics, uh, and and so I think the European leaders are a little queasy about that. Uh, and wanting to make sure it's more carefully planned. Now, at the end of the day, European countries are receiving many of these, you know, exiting Europe, uh, I'm sorry, exiting Afghanistan. I just read, in fact, a, an interesting story today. Mexico, our neighbor to the south, has just actually helped to evacuate some of the journalists, and specifically New York Times and Washington Post journalists. And in getting back to your earlier point about our broken uh, refugee, uh, or let's say uh, immigration policy, they were able to very quickly on a dime turn around and provide a uh, safe haven uh, to, uh, to the U.S. journalists uh, who couldn't get out, let's say, even you know, with U.S. support. Uh, and so that's a curious little thing because as we've spoken in other times, uh, U.S. and Mexico at the moment have you know, tough relations between the president, uh, but uh, Mexico is kind of getting a, a couple of little brownie points by, by this move. Uh, but you have, you have uh, many of these exiting now are going throughout Europe. Australia is also taking some. The U.S. is also going to be receiving you know, a fair number. Uh, but I think it's fair to say many, many more who would like to come are not going to be able to exit. And so they're going to be stuck in the new. Well, I think Taliban. it's going to be a lot of drama. And even yeah. though it's dangerous for you know, members of the press to be there right now, they can communicate with satellite phones. They do yeah. communicate yeah. with satellite of course. phones. They don't need any infrastructure to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's, there's going to be some very tough, um, if not violent, experiences in the next few days over there. Everybody in the world will be watching. And so, mm -hmm. you know, going back to the question of how will the world see this? Well, it kind of depends because yeah. we, we, we got more efficient over the past few days um, and we looked better over the past few days. But I think going forward, we, we have tremendous risk of being embarrassed much more than we were embarrassed before. Um, if there is violence at the airport or on the roads. The other yeah. thing is, um, you know, you still have the possibility that Al-Qaeda and ISIS will reemerge in the new Afghanistan and pose a long distance threat as they did before, like on 9-11. Um, and you, know, you can say, well, the new Taliban may not, may not permit that. They, they said they would not, I don't believe it. Uh, they may well permit it. We may have Al-Qaeda and ISIS both. Uh, operating in the new Afghanistan, and they would be directed against us and other yeah. countries. So that if, if that happens, uh, it's an, another black eye for us, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. And again, a lot of uncertainty there. Uh, now, the world will be watching and trying, but we won't have the capacity without having a, any presence there. Uh, and even the idea right now of pressuring Afghanistan, you know, squeezing them, because uh, right now they've got a lot of uh, some obligations uh, uh, to pay, you know, whether it's IMF loans and other uh, financial obligations. And, you know, the typical, uh, you know, international community response is, well, you squeeze them with sanctions. Well, guess what? The Taliban probably aren't going to be either cooperating or acting in ways that we might expect. Uh, and they might be, you know, simply able to weather it more 
so things, uh, I think it's going to be harder for the outside world, uh, the international community, to have uh, influence you know, and, and have the capacity to shape it. So it's going to be, it's going to be a tough uh, road ahead. Uh, and uh, again, we just don't know. It could get very ugly very soon in the coming days. Let's hope uh, the worst doesn't happen, but we're going to have to wait and see and, and if, see how if it plays rationality out. prevails, if Bar Asada is a rational person and he can control all the Taliban around the country to be rational, um, they would be well advised to do that because their money hangs in the balance. They will not be able to make friends in the country or out of the country uh, without being civilized. Uh, but yeah. it's, it's really an interesting question in our time. Uh, we, we live in strange times, Carlos, whether they yes. will be rational. We, we're not particularly rational in this country, uh, which, which, takes, which takes me to the last question I wanted to open with you. And mm -hmm. that is, uh, has all this effect um, national politics? You know, uh, it has sucked all the oxygen out of Biden's priorities. Mm -hmm. um, it's made him look bad, but it's also made him look bad on all his other initiatives. And, and those initiatives are hanging the balance as far as the elections in 2022 are, are concerned. And so if, if he loses face some more, he's already lost face, uh, in Afghanistan, and his, and his initiatives in Congress are stuck, um, if, if not in, in whole, then in part. Um, and, uh, you know, all these things go south on him. He, he's, his, his probability, the probability of the Democrats are going to hold on to the majority in either house is reduced uh, in the next election, right? Yeah, well, absolutely. I think more than anything, it speaks to how we have to look at international politics, understanding the domestic uh, impact it can have or how domestic politics may shape it. Uh, you know, Afghanistan is a complicated story, and, and, and it's fair to say that Americans, after, what, 20 years now of, of very, very difficult, uh, you know, situations in the Middle East, Iraq, and Afghanistan, don't have a, a big desire to want to become the, you know, global police force anymore, and, and, and even, you know, under Biden and his, you know, sort of foreign policy perspective, he has offered, a, let's say, a, a view of making it a more middle-class foreign policy, helping, you know, the people of the U.S., well, this is going to be challenging to see if it plays out well. Uh, but bottom line is that with domestic politics more polarized and divisive than ever, you're going to see obviously some of the Republicans trying to you know milk this for what they can. It's going to be a a little dicey because this is not going to you know like some of the immediate blame will be on Biden maybe for for some of the mistakes and missteps. But at the end of the day, this is a policy that was basically over the last 20 years and even in the more recent Trump administration. You know, it was facilitated by all of them. Uh, it was begun by the Bush administration, uh, and then the more recent Trump administration carried out, uh, of course, its own negotiations directly with the Taliban. Uh, and uh, so, and yet, having said all that, I think most Americans don't, you know, they don't look at the nuances. They just see it as, a, what are we doing there? And at the end of the day, if we see horrible humanitarian, you know, disaster, which is what's unfolding, there's going to be a, you know, a desire to blame somebody. And then, at the end of the day, when election politics here, domestic politics come in, it becomes very easy to, to try to make it real simple, find a scapegoat or, or make it seem real black and white when it never is. It's always more complicated. Uh, but that's why we have shows like these to flush out a little more to understand that it's not all black and white. There, there's a lot of you know, gray areas and uncertainty, and that's the world we live in. Yeah, well, Biden is a very decent guy, a decent president, a moral man. He may not be a great president, though, and he may not be the president we need in these very difficult times, times where you begin with COVID and then you, you know, go into other horrible issues and existential threats from there, lest we, lest we forget for one moment climate change, for example, <clears throat> which the yeah, world is yeah. not doing a good job on. So what's yeah. your level of optimism, Carlos? Looking <laughs> forward <clears throat> from this point of view of the Afghan, what do you want to call it? pivot point here. Yeah. How optimistic or pessimistic are you about this nation? Well, I, I would separate maybe the Afghanistan situation right now. That's a lot of uncertainty. It's possibly, it's probable that we're going to see it get ugly in the near term. And then we're going to see a lot of people desperate to want to get out. And who knows how the Taliban, is it going to become a, you know, a bloody situation or, or not? Again, there's a lot of uncertainty there. The other bigger picture, I mean, again, there's so many variables going on and, and you know, whether, I mean, I, I kind of, uh, you know, will this become the legacy for Biden? Will Afghanistan be the albatross that he's stuck with? Will it bring him down? I don't know. My gut feeling is it's probably not, that, that a month or two from now, we're going to see a different dynamic. The U.S. will be gone effectively. Uh, there will still need to be a continued process of, of 
getting Afghans out, but will the Taliban cooperate? Will they allow borders to open so many others can go to Pakistan, to other you know, European countries? That remains to be seen, and there's not a lot of optimism that they're going to be cooperating. Uh, you know, no reason to believe that. Uh, so I think uh, it's, the Afghan situation is going to be grim. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to have a nice, easy outcome, but it may get better in, in, in the near term. Beyond that, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of what happens in world politics, we, we just can't always anticipate. Uh, the, you know, this, this crisis two months ago could have been anticipated, but wasn't. Here we are now dealing with a you know, the most dramatic crisis, certainly uh, uh, in, in, well, in a long time. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. We live in times when everything, uh, all the variables are in play. And yeah. furthermore, the, that they can change dynamically. I mean, yeah. remarkably in a matter of That's right. minutes, hours, days at the, at the max. Yeah. And so, so when I ask you your level of optimism or pessimism, or when I ask you to predict what is going to go on? That is a completely unfair question, and I am sorry. <laughs> but hey, you know, we have to do it. We have to do it. But but no, I mean, I think of it as having as if you're playing like six chess games at the same time, you know, at different levels with different people, and and the, you know, they're all in some ways connected. But boy, it is really tough because a moving part here, moving part there. And we do need to understand Afghanistan is not an isolated single country, it's part of a larger geopolitical agenda. It has a historical context that we've been involved with for some time now. And, you know, given, look, again, 20 years and look at how many, you know, of our, of our military have, you know, deployed there and, 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 you know, going there to help this country and now feeling obviously a bit of uh, anxiety, like what, what, was it worth it? Did, you know, was it in vain or what? It, that's a tough dilemma for anybody to face. Uh, and, you know, Afghanistan is a very large country and, and it has a large diaspora now. Many have left and will continue to leave. So it's going to be a story that will stick with us for some time. Uh, we're going to have communities uh, you know, of Afghans that are going to now expand in parts of the U.S. that uh, are going to continue to have the legacy of this, of this war. Uh, and uh, it's not a pretty ending. Uh, and it's not, a, you know, we used to have wars that we came home and had parades and everybody was happy. Those days are not with us now. This is oh, a, no. a, a messy, messy situation. Yeah. Well, I hope you will continue to cover it, Carlos. Uh, on Global Connections, I know you will. And I look forward to further discussions on your show uh, about what is happening and all the implications that will follow. Uh, Carlos Absolutely. Suarez at the East West Center, thank you so much. Aloha, thank you, Jay. Aloha.